Daniel chapter 2. Now, we began Daniel last week, and we talked about, discovered, discussed, more like a monologue, but we still did it, about Daniel, discussing what it was, why we chose it, looking at the different things about this particular book that make it special, that make it unique. I said that this book has a lot to say about the future. There are a lot of predictions that are made, prophecies that are given. It prophesies the future Greek empire. It prophesies the future Medo-Persian empire. It prophesies the coming of Rome. Before that, the dispersion of Greece into the four generals. If you know your history well, you'll understand what I mean. When Alexander the Great died, the four generals took over the reigning territories of the Grecian Empire, and that is mentioned in this book. Also, it deals with the future, like the future, the consummation, and the end of all things. It deals with even the Antichrist. Now, that's a term we don't think about when you read the Old Testament, because the term Antichrist doesn't show up in the Old Testament. He has quite a different name. His name's called the Little Horn, but that little horn becomes a big horn in the sense that he controls everything, and therefore in the book of Revelation, we learn about the Antichrist, but even in that book, he's not called the Antichrist. What is he called in Revelation? There's a name given to him. It's not the Antichrist. The Beast. He's always called the Beast. The only place in the Bible that gives the term Antichrist that title, that individual, that person is the book of 1 John. The writings of John, the epistles of John, mention him by that particular title. It is the most popular name for the future coming world leader who control the world, but that's not the only name. Paul calls him the son of perdition, perdition. right. And Daniel calls him the little horn, all right? So a lot is addressed in this book, a lot's being consumed and a lot of things are going to be brought up. Now, I say consumed, excuse the pun, because fire is a big part of this book. Oh, yeah. uh, and especially when we get to chapter three, we'll be talking about that. Now, when we got, when we talked about Daniel last time, we did discuss also the breakdown. The book has two parts, chapters one through six, which is the rise and prominence of Daniel. And then we have chapter seven through 12, which are the predictions and the prophecies of Daniel. Now, those two parts have more sections that are built up, more things that, that comprise those particular chapters. So when you look at chapters 1 through 6, what we find is we have, number one, the, the elevation of Daniel. God elevates Daniel from what? A fugitive, a slave, to now being a, an emissary into the court of Babylon, into the court of Nebuchadnezzar, the ruling leader. That's what chapter one's about. But he's not the only one. There's three companions, right? And those three companions who had their names changed, we may talk about that again. We may not. We'll see where it leads us. They come, and they're part of it as well. And it turns out by the end of chapter one that their knowledge, their understanding, given by the grace of God to their minds, is ten times greater than anyone else who's being trained in the ways of the Babylonian system. Now, to the Hebrew, the Babylonians are pagan. Therefore, Daniel is being thrust into a foreign world. And when we did our studies in Genesis, we know the same thing happened to Joseph. He being thrown into slavery, being brought into a pagan culture, and then what happens to Joseph? God elevates him from being basically a slave, from a prisoner, to now second in charge of Egypt. And from that blessing, all of the sons of Jacob come into Egypt and they just grow and grow and grow and populate until we come to the book of Exodus. And that is what God uses at Egyptians' expense, by the way, the land of Goshen to make and, and help Israel as a nation become a fertile, wealthy nation. Not only that, out of the 10 plagues, they take all the gold with them. And so they take all the treasures of Egypt with them, and they're on their way. And that begins the book of Exodus. But this all came because there was a man named Joseph, a righteous man, who was brought into slavery, and God had a plan that he did not see. But at the end of Genesis, he says, what you, talking to his brothers who sold him to slavery, what you meant for evil, God has turned for good. Daniel is in the same kind of boat. So we begin chapter 2, what happens? We read these first words in chapter 2. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, 
Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled that his sleep left him. Now, I want to focus on the second year part, because you know me. I don't let any detail pass me. Even if it seems logical and understandable, why, why, even, why pass it through if I can somehow dig some nug out of it? This goes back to the point I'm talking about regarding Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar, he's a general. He has a father, Nabu Palassar. Nabu Palassar is his name. <laughs> How do you spell that word? <laughs> uh, um, think of it as Nabu Palassar or Nabu Palassar, N A B O or N E B O P O L A S S A R. Nabu Palassar. He was the ruling king of, of Babylon. He sends his son to conquer a bunch of regions. And in 605, he comes to Jerusalem, and he wants to take over. And we know the story. We talked about this. He doesn't actually conquer Jerusalem. A couple of reasons. Why? Because in chapter 1, it says, In the third year of reign, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, that man, Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, which are the first words of Daniel, the book of Daniel, he ends up giving himself up. He doesn't fight against Nebuchadnezzar. So what does Nebuchadnezzar do? He brings captives and he steals treasure. He brings all the great treasures of Jerusalem and he hoards it and brings it. Now, why the exit so quickly back to Babylon? He was on a campaign. If you had his agenda, if you had his yearly itinerary for 605 BC, you'd realize he had quite a busy year. He was conquering here, Carchemish. He conquered Carchemish before he came to Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem, and by, it's only June at this point. And so by June, he conquers Jerusalem. But then he leaves immediately and goes back to his hometown. He goes 600 miles. The question is why? He doesn't even conquer Jerusalem yet. That doesn't come until many years, not many years later, but uh, several years, many, well, many years later, I guess, in 586 BC. What happens is word sent to him, his father, Nebuchadnezzar, died. So he's rushing back to secure his position as king, because you know how it works when pagan kings die. There's always these wars. Just read, if you just study your, study the Caesars, just study the Caesars, and if you study your Roman history, you'll get the idea. So son-elect is, heir-elect is now going to rush back. He brings the captives, brings the treasures, and in this captive group of 605 is Daniel. Now we begin chapter 2 with this particular phrase, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, that's kind of odd because chapter 1 to 2, how could he be the second year already? Especially knowing that at the end of chapter 1, we know that Daniel's been there for three years already. How do we know that? Because in Daniel's world, he was being groomed to be a part of the Babylonian system. And it's a three-year process. You take young men who are intelligent and they're healthy, and you mold them into the Babylonian system. You eradicate and tear out anything of their Hebrew heritage, their Hebrew culture, and what you do is you make them into a darn good Babylonian. You even change their names. And we talked all about that last time. The problem is, is that when Nebuchadnezzar becomes king because his father's dead, that's in September of 605. That's about the time that Daniel gets there. But this should be then the third year of Nebuchadnezzar. The problem is when daddy dies, daddy, who's dead, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, his year of his death is still his reign, even though he's dead. So Nebuchadnezzar's reigning years don't begin till the year after. So he's a little behind in our, he's three years into it, but he's behind in our terms because in the ancient world, a king who died was still king by title for that year. Okay, that makes sense? I hope that lays anything to rest if you ever had a doubt in your mind and thinking, because what, here's why I'm saying this. Here's why I'm trying to say this. What is the distance of time between chapter one and chapter two? It's about three years. That's the point I'm trying to say. But it may seem strange that Nebuchadnezzar was already emperor at this point, chapter one, how could it be three years? I just, who, who knows? And the old magazine, Inquiring Minds Want to Know. Maybe someone wants to know these details. Some people pick up on this stuff. That's kind of good. That's kind of cool. All right. Now, so it says here, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he had dreams. Notice the plural. And his spirit was troubled that his sleep left him. Verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. 
to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now, this is not new to us Bible students, because in Genesis, we saw a lot of this, did we not? Jacob had dreams, did he not? Joseph had dreams. This is not new to us. So you see, one of the benefits you're going to have being here is because you've gone through, you've gone through the, the trials of Genesis, chapters 1 through 50, you've been well equipped to handle all the stuff that's going to come after. So stuff that hits us that may seem strange to the new reader is going to be like, oh, we've covered that before. That's happened before. We understand that little issue, that little nuance. It's going to be natural for us. So Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan. This is not a godly man. We're not talking about a man who's searching for God. We're talking about a man who is basically in all of his essence and in his identity is against God in every possible way. And he has a dream. And the dream, or the dreams, I should say, are are as such that they are troublesome to him, so much so that he cannot sleep. As a matter of fact, it suggests the concept that it's disturbance. It's a great disturbance happening to him. And these dreams that may have been going on longer than one particular night. It may have gone on for some time. So what does he do with this disturbance? He calls in basically four groups of people. He's calling in everyone in the world that has any claim to superhuman understanding. He gives them by titles, here they are. And you know some of these names, you've heard of them before. Magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. That's everybody, ladies and gentlemen. There's no one else on the planet who has a claim to have a superior knowledge of things beyond human experience and human endeavor. These are the people. Now, what are they specifically? Well, here, the first term we have here is the word sorcerer. And the word sorcerer, or I'm sorry, magician. The word magician can be a little little tricky because the text in here would suggest a scholar. There's other words being given to people who try to use incantations and spells. That's coming up. But the term magician here would be particularly a scholar or a well-learned scholar of some kind. Then we have the term here, astrologers. That also is a little bit misleading as well. What that would be would be someone who uses necromancy. That means they claim to speak to the dead. People who cast spells or produce incantations. But in those days are called astrologers, or at least in our translation. But the astrologers are coming later. That will just give it to you right now. Those are the Chaldeans. So the Chaldeans are the star readers. They're the ones who know the stars. If you look at the wise men of Matthew chapter 2, they were... The Magi, they were the scholars, but they were of the Chaldean line, which means they were the stargazers, okay? And then we have the sorcerers. These are the ones who practice incantations and sorcery. They were the witches, okay? So you have the witches, you have the scholars, you have the star readers, and you have those who have the power of necromancy. That means to, it, to speak with the dead. In other words, the mediums, all right? That kind of crowd. So you've got a pretty vicious um, pagan Kind of not very pleasant crowd here, but they all are under the authority of the king. Now, you're going to realize as I read these verses, Nebuchadnezzar is not an ordinary king. He's not a typical king who is bound by any of his own laws. As a matter of fact, we know in the Bible, it basically states where we know about Nebuchadnezzar is that Nebuchadnezzar was a law unto himself. That's a term about him. He was law unto himself. That means most kings in the ancient world, whether you're in Medo-Persia or whether even you are a Caesar, if you decreed something and it's written down and the scribes take it out of the room, you cannot rescind it. It has been ascribed by the laws. You are stuck by the scroll that is written on and it is what it is, whether you change your mind or not. Nebuchadnezzar was one of those kinds of guys who didn't seem to care about that rule. So therefore, if you decreed something and didn't like it, it didn't matter, you rip it up. That was, that's not normally how other cultures worked. So he was truly an autonomous ruler. You're going to see that here. You're also going to see something in, I want you to pick up on a certain attitude that Nebuchadnezzar has to these individuals that are in front of him. So here we begin in verse 4. Then the Chaldeans, now notice here carefully, four groups of people are presented in front of Nebuchadnezzar. But as we read these verses, only one of these groups are speaking. 
and those are the Chaldeans. Why the Chaldeans? Because they are considered in the ancient culture a, a high ranked race group of people. That is why when the Magi came, Herod, you would think that Herod, who was a bloodthirsty tyrant, wouldn't care about a bunch of guys on, on camels with an entourage coming his way. But when you read the text of Matthew 2, he gives them ultimate respect. Apparently, the Chaldeans demanded respect for the entire ancient world. So here they are here, and they're coming in saying, we're going to speak. You sorcerers and witches and astrologers, you, you come behind us. We're the authority here. We're going to be talking. But they speak for them. Okay, so the sorcerers and the, the witches and the astrologers, they're all basically allowing the Chaldeans. So verse 4, then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. Now remember we talked about the word Aramaic is here. I had to say something about this, something very important about this. You know Daniel is written in two languages. The book was written in two languages by Daniel. It's written in Hebrew. Chapter 1 all the way to chapter 2, verse 3. But from right here at this moment... Chapter 2, verse 4, all the way to chapter 7, verse 28, it's in another language. It's in Aramaic. Now, the question is, why is that? Does anyone remember what I said about that last time? Any thoughts about that? He was trained? Well, he was trained, but Daniel's not in this at all. Oh, well, Daniel's writing this. Forgive me. I should say, well, I'm saying the scene. He's not in the scene. But the reason why it's in Aramaic is because... All the information we're going to get in chapter 2, all the way to chapter 7, for a large part of it is dealing with Gentile nations. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the language of the Gentiles is being presented in predominance here. In prominence, I should say. It's, it's more prominent because its focus is not on the Hebrew nation. It's not on people of, of Daniel's clan, but it's on the world of the Gentile world and its powers and its history and its future. Also, keep in mind that Aramaic was used throughout the entire world. It was used, not I want to say the world, but the ancient world, the Chaldeans knew of it. It was in the courts of the Babylonians. It was also required to be spoken by Daniel himself as a servant of the court. So it's not a surprise that he writes half or part of the five chapters of Daniel into Aramaic. And it says right here in Aramaic. So here we have, then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king... Live forever. Well, that's kind of nice. Nice words to say. <laughs> Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. That sounds fair. Give us the dream you said, and let us give you the interpretation. Verse 5. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation... You shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a heap or ash heap. However, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. That's pretty harsh. So, I want you to recognize something here. Most scholars hold the view that the people that these, these Chaldeans these magicians, astrologers, these sorcerers, these men are older men who served Nebuchadnezzar's king, our father, who was king, Nabopolassar, Nabopolassar. And Nabopolassar was used to having these guys run the show. If you look at Nebuchadnezzar's history, you recognize something about him. Before his destruction of Jerusalem, he was a very pragmatic guy. He also was a guy who had a lot of victories. And he doesn't seem to have any interest in soothsayers giving him any hope for anything. Because like Alexander the Great, Nebuchadnezzar conquered and won every war he was involved with. So he comes and he has some troubling dreams. And he has to deal with people who are on the payroll that are coming to him because his father paid them well, and he wants them to answer the question. Now, what you're led to believe here is that Nebuchadnezzar does not know, he does not know what his dream was. He may have forgotten it. I'm going to tell you now that is not true. It's going to reveal itself sooner or later as we get closer to verse 22. You're going to realize that he knows exactly what his dream was. 
but he wants the Chaldeans, he wants these advisors to give him the dream and the interpretation. Why? Because he has no interest in this crowd. He has no interest in these, in these old guys who have been running amok, who have been giving corruption and lies. Because of that, he doesn't want these guys to be around any longer. He wants a clean house. So he gives them this, this alternative. Now, if he had forgotten the dream, then why would he have such a severe penalty for them not reminding him or telling what the dream was? If he'd forgotten it, then he would need help on remembering it. Mm -hmm. Certainly you couldn't say, I'm gonna cut you into pieces if you don't give me the dream, if he himself didn't quite know what it was. Even the language there tells you he already knew, but later we're gonna find out. Now, why the cutting into pieces? Why not just, you know, not get paid for a week? You know, or, or get thrown in prison. Well, why that? Because that was the punishment the ancient world was known to do. The Assyrians and the Persians were experts at really inculcating barbarity into its prisoners and into those they were punishing. You just read the ancient documents. It's, it's, it's just not pleasant. It's horrible. Horrible. And so for him, this is probably an everyday occurrence. Yeah, I'll cut you in pieces if you don't give me, the, give me the, what I need to know. Now, you would think at this point, the Chaldeans who were speaking are thinking, oh, that's not good. We see the writing on the wall. Something is wrong here. We have to change our tactic. But here's what happens. Here's what they say. Verse 7, they answered and said, let the king tell his servants the dream that we will give us interpretation. Well, that's like a broken record. That's what verse 4 said. It's like they didn't hear. Did you not hear what the king said? Either you're going to be like, you know, fed to the alligators or you're going to be, you know, or you're going to have rewards. And they're like, they're, they're just somehow writing it off like, oh, you're just the son of the king that died. You couldn't possibly want to get rid of us. <laughs> Listen to his response. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time. That means you would buy time because you see that my decision is firm. That is, I'm not going to waver from my decision. You want to buy time for me, don't you? If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have to agree to speak, I'm sorry, you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. So he's calling their bluff. He knows you claim, you claim to have supernatural knowledge. You claim to my father that. And I saw all the tricks you pulled, my dad. I saw all the times you said things and deep down I knew you were lying. But my dad was getting older, a little senile. He bought your lies. I'm not going to put up with it. I'm not going to pay for you anymore. So you get, the, you get the kingdom if you get my answer. You give me the answer I want, you get everything. It's like, that's what it is. It's just, I give you rewards, I give you honor if you do what I want you to do. So they have another chance to answer. So what do they say? I love this dialogue, fascinating. <laughs> Verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth. Who can tell the king's matter? Therefore, no king, no lord, no ruler has ever asked such thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. And that's clever. That's clever because what you know what they're doing is they're trying to give the king flattery. They call him three terms in this. The Chaldeans give him three titles in this response. They say here, no king, lord, or ruler. They're referring to him. You're the king. You're our lord. You are our ruler. It's a sort of kind of a nice flattery. And not only that, they say this. Your problem is a problem that no man can solve. The only thing that can solve your problem is the gods themselves. They're the only ones who can take up this difficult matter. That's what they mean when they say the last phrase here. And there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. In other words, no man can solve this problem. And your problem is so unique and so um, yeah, mysterious and singular that uh, only the gods can answer the inquiry of you. The, the actual language here is you personally, you Nebuchadnezzar, not any king, you. So it is a very flattering thing. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't care about the flattery. What he wants to do is he wants to get rid of them. And he knows they're lying through their teeth. And he knows you're just a bunch of fakes. 
So what's his response to this? He is what it is. For this reason, the king, verse 12, was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out that they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, this is a hard place to be to be Daniel because if you read the last part of chapter 1, you'll find it says here in verse 19, the king, that is Nebuchadnezzar, interviewed Daniel, Hananiah, Misrael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. That's what was said about Daniel, and now he's a target. Now he's going to be killed. Now, keep in mind something very important. Situational awareness. Where is Daniel in this particular scene of chapter 2? He's not there in the court. He's not there at all. He's outside the court. Why is that? Possibly because he's younger. He's not considered to be on equal par. He may be 10 times greater, but let's go back to Jesus. When Jesus was 12 years old, we found him in the temple. Remember, Mary and Joseph sort of lost him, so to speak. And what happened when he was in the temple? He was teaching who? The, the rabbis, the Pharisees. He was giving them knowledge as a young person. Yet he wasn't called a rabbi. He would not be looked at as, hey, join our ranks. Merely the parents find him and they bring him out of the temple. But the fact remains, he was greater in knowledge at 12 than all of the consummate knowledge of, of, uh, of Israel in the scriptures. So here's Daniel. Already know, we already know that he's 10 times greater than all of the magicians and Chaldeans and astrologers, but yet he's not in this group. Why? Because these guys, these fakes, are pulling rank. That's the whole point. I was with your father when he went on that campaign 55 years ago. I was there. And that's the kind of thing. They're old, they're old men who are just, they've, they've lived fat on the, on, the, uh, on, on, the, on the land for so long. They've been paid by his father. And Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have an interest for it's possible Nebuchadnezzar wanted a youthful, younger group to come in. That doesn't mean that Nebuchadnezzar was not into astrology or that he wasn't into pagan. He was a full-on pagan. But for some reason, this is a character problem. He believes they're absolutely lying in their fakes. But it doesn't mean he's against someone who can have an answer. That's important. So Daniel discovers he's in trouble because it's all the wise men in his realm are going to be gathered up. Now, how is this killing supposed to happen? It isn't as if somehow they, they kill them one by one as they see them. We can tell by the text, and what's going to happen in a little bit here, that Daniel is going to intercede in some way, and that what may be happening is that Arioch, that is the captain of the guard, is going to collect all the wise men to bring into the dungeons of Babylon for a moment of execution that may come at some point in our modern day, like a firing squad someday in the future, but at this point it'd be like, you know, something much worse than that. You know, something, they probably think up some torturous thing to kill them. So the point being is, they're gathering all for a purpose of one point to kill them. And so verse 14 begins this way. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is a decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. That's sort of fascinating. Arioch is not only the captain of the guard. What he really is, is he is also the executioner in the sense that he'll gather them together and he'll be responsible for killing them. Now, what, why did Daniel... Why did Arioch even spend a moment listening to Daniel? Possibly because of Daniel's performance in chapter 1. Because of the impressions he made upon Daniel in chapter 1, that is, I'm sorry, Daniel made upon him and upon the king in chapter 1, what's happened is, is that Arioch will listen out. Notice also too, verse 14, the most important words are here, right there. Then with counsel and wisdom... So Daniel seems to be addressing the authority of the Babylonians differently than the Chaldeans did. 
I want you to understand this contrast. The Chaldeans represent the highest form of wisdom in the ancient Babylonian world. The ancient Chaldean paganist, uh, paganist, or I guess pagan system. It's not only Babylon, it's everywhere. Ur of the Chaldees is all of it. So they represent the highest of wisdom, yet Daniel comes with a higher wisdom. He comes with counsel and with wisdom. And what he does is he comes to Arioch and he begins to ask Arioch a very simple question. Now, the way, the way this is worded here is, why is it so urgent? Now, that could sound almost threatening, like, why is the king so urgently doing this? But the original language suggests a more kinder, but the, our English doesn't have a way of saying it, but why, why does he feel the need? What's the need to have this urgency of action? And Arioch is listening to this, and he begins to disclose the reasoning to Daniel. And then here it says in verse 16, so Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time. So Arak allows Daniel to come with him to the presence of the king. Now, we have to assume that this was not 15 minutes later. This was not even an hour later. It could have been a day. It could have been two. It could have been a week. We don't know how long it is. Whatever it is, Arioch feels that Nebuchadnezzar's jets have cooled, that he's calmed down a bit. He's not so angry with basically saying off with their heads. So he brings Daniel there in front of the king that he might tell the king the interpretation. Notice that phrase right there. Let's read it again, verse 16. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. What is Daniel doing here? He's saying what the Chaldeans could not say. He's saying, give me time and I will answer you. I will give you what you want. The Chaldeans, the sorcerers, the astrologers, the magicians couldn't do that. But he's saying, I will. You just have to allow me the time. And because of that time, here's what happens. Then Daniel went to his house. So he's given time. And here he is. Daniel went to this house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. That they might, verse 18, that they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now, in the last chapter, I'm going to try, if there's one particular verse, if there's one particular thing you want to remember about chapter 1, it's that one verse where it says, and Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. The fact we're learning something about Daniel's character. If you, can, if you remember nothing about chapter 1 at all, that's fine. You don't have to worry about chapter 1. Just remember Daniel purposed in his heart not to compromise his worship of God. That's the application for you and I. What does chapter 2 have an application for you and I? It's right here. Keep in mind something. Have any of us been in an urgent situation? Oh, yes, I'm sure we have been. You may not be an urgent where death's coming and knocking on your door at any moment, but nonetheless, urgency has happened in our lives. Daniel has a sense of urgency. He also has a sense of urgency. We know the level of that urgency because it's going to lead to death. And what is the example? Because Daniel's one of the most awesome men in the Bible. What's his example? He goes home, he goes to the three companions who are all godly, God-worshipping men, and what do they do? They seek the mercies of God. They go in prayer. They go in supplication and prayer to lift up this matter. That's the application for you and I. You're facing a problem in life. You may think you have every clever idea to solve it. Daniel was smarter than the Chaldeans because he was real. He was wiser than the Chaldeans. But he's not thinking about trying to ease his way out of this. He accepts the fact the king has had a decree. We're all going to die. He realizes that. I can't run. I can't hide. I can't put mud on my face and change my look and somehow mingle among the people and be lost. He realizes what really matters is I need to come to God. And let God give me. And he knew that when he met the king at the moment he saw the king. Because he tells the king a promise. He says, I will give you the interpretation. 
don't kill anyone, just give me time and I'll give you the interpretation. And so he goes, and what does he do? He goes straight in prayer. And what we're realizing here is there's a contrast between the decree of God, or the decree of the king, forgive me, which is death, and the mercy of God, who is the only authentic judge, who's not decreeing death. There's the contrast. The king gets upset, doesn't like these guys. He may have a good reason to do it, to want to get rid of them. But he says, off with your heads, basically. Daniel goes to the God of comfort, the God of mercies, the God of tender mercies, and says here to seek the mercies, verse 18, that they might seek the mercies from the God of heaven. Now, this is very important. Why does Daniel write in Aramaic, the God of heaven? So that when you're Aramaic reader, you realize the God of Daniel is superior to the pantheon of the Babylonian pagan system. How many gods are in the Babylonian pagan system? Quite a few. I'm just going to put that just quite a few. You could not count them. You can, you can count them every day of your life, and you will never get enough of them. They'll, the, name, the, the, the names go on forever. The pantheon is large. The pantheon, the pantheon is exhaustive. And what he's saying is the God of heaven. But remember, let's go back to the four categories of these men, these wise men. Chaldeans, magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers. They were star readers. They were necromancers. They are people who tried to communicate with things. They tried to look at the items or the, the, uh, the existence of celestial beings as gods themselves. All pagan mythologies, all pagan cosmogenies, that is the idea of how the creation began, and cosmologies, how you look at the stars and what they mean, all of those things were based on the concept that the gods that the ancient worlds worshipped were made of the things that humanity sees. So there's a God of the ocean. Look, just go back to Greek mythology. There's a God of the ocean, right? There's a God of the sky. There's a God of, there's, there's a God of, of the earth. There's a God of the frogs. That's Egyptian uh, mythology. There's a God for everything. There's a God for the air. There's a God for love. There's a God for women. There's a God for fertility. There's a God for war. There's a God for happiness. There's a God for wisdom. Everything we can experience, there's a God for. What Dale's saying is, the God I worship is beyond his creation. He's separate from his creation. He's the God, the Lord, the King of heaven, which is to the pagan, everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, the word heavens, it doesn't say in the beginning, God created the universe, does it? It doesn't say that, but that's what's meant in Genesis chapter one. God created the universe, the heavens, all that exists that we can see, and then he singles out earth. That's a discussion for another time. So, God of heaven. And then he says here, the mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret so that David and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Notice that Daniel is also praying for those pagan men who are claiming to have supernatural knowledge. He's praying for them too. He doesn't want them to perish. Well, maybe Daniel thinks, you know, once they realize who the real God is, they'll begin to worship him and become true believers. You know, Daniel was right in the sense because we know that the descendants, the, the, academic, the academic descendants of Daniel became the Magi who knew about Jesus' birth before anyone else did. So certainly his thinking was right. But again, he was very wise. Verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now, when we talk about prophecy and prophets in the Old Testament, you will know what mode God spoke to the prophet by how the book begins. So if you start with the book Isaiah and you go all the way to the book of Malachi, Every beginning part of those books will tell you the mode in which God used to give knowledge to that individual prophet. So when Isaiah says what he says, he says it because God has imparted to him in some way. What are the three modes in which God has done it? Through the word of the Lord coming upon the mind, through dreams, and through visions. Those are the three ways in which God has imparted his word to people. Now, Joel, the book of Joel, has an interesting little thing in there because it says that 
because a lot of Christians believe that there are no more, there are, there will there'll, there'll not be any more dreams or visions. Historically, historically, there can be truth to that, but Joel has a very interesting statement that we all have to take to heart. He says that I, your daughters and your sons will prophesy in the latter days at the end of the world. Your old men will dream dreams. The mode from which God had imparted his knowledge to men is going and to come back into people in the latter days. So though God gave dreams and visions and the word of the Lord being pressed upon the mind, you will know the mode by reading the first chapter of any, God, of any prophet, and you will know. Now, Daniel is unique because Daniel is in the prophets, but we don't see at the beginning at all the mode from which God spoke to him. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew Bible, Isaac, or sorry, Daniel is not part of the prophets. He's part of the books of wisdom. But he functions as a prophet, but he also functions as an emissary. So he's given a unique status. He's kind of a unique character as, as a prophet. And so here we have this term night vision. Now, this is unique. This is not a dream. It isn't like they were praying and had a dream. It's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a, 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 yeah, a the, the word of the Lord being impressed upon the mind. What it is, is Daniel gets a vision while he's awake at night. They're praying at night and God reveals to Daniel a vision as he is awake, conscious and completely aware of what's going on. That's what's happening here. Rare to see the term night vision. Does not show up very often in the Bible. And so this particular vision is something that God does uniquely. Now, what happens here is what Daniel's response is. So the night vision is given. Daniel now knows. So Daniel blesses the God of heaven. And Daniel says this in verse 20. And what I'm going to read to you is literally a hymn. It is literally a psalm. That's what it is. It's actually a psalm of Daniel. A song. That's what the word psalm means. It's a song of Daniel. And Daniel here is going to show us a lot of things about who God is. He's going to show us some very amazing things. First of all, you need to know, in this particular, in this particular phrase between verses 20 through 23, we find that Daniel quotes from Genesis. He quotes from Exodus, 2 Chronicles. He quotes from Job, Psalms, and Isaiah. In, the, in just verses 20 to 23. So we know that as he was a captive, a foreigner, a fugitive, stuck in a foreign land, it shows you his exhaustive understanding of the scriptures that he had known, which shows that the scriptures were already in a canon. This is really important. It's why many critics of the Bible hate Daniel, because it shows that there's no way this guy could have been in the sixth century who could have been <laughs> quoting all this stuff and actually know all this. And what it's saying is, no, Daniel was there in the 6th century. He was quoting these books, which means that they were considered canon by the Hebrews. That means the, the, the closed circle of books that make what we have the scripture. Now, there's other books that certainly he could have quoted from. These are the ones he just happened to quote from. Doesn't mean the others. Second Chronicles means there's the first Chronicles, obviously. A Job would solve, the fact that there are Psalms suggests there's going to be also Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, as his son Solomon wrote. So, he quotes from all these different books in this short little phrase, and we learn something about God himself. So, verse 20, let me read it for you. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Very simple. God is establishing his omniscience. God is establishing his omnipotence. The wisdom and the might, all consolidated in those two words. Everything you need to know about understanding your faith in God is given to you in that phrase right there. And then we get to verse 21. And he changes the times and the seasons. That means he has the power over all that has been created. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who are understanding. So, a couple of things being mentioned here. Not only has God revealed himself 
revealed by what has been made, by his wisdom, by his might. He has the power to change the seasons, to make them what they are now. Later in Daniel, we're going to learn about the Antichrist. And there's a particular thing about the Antichrist we know. That the Antichrist's function, one of them, is to desire to do what? Based on what I just said about times and seasons. Exactly. He wants to change the times and the seasons. That is one of the unique features of the Antichrist. Whatever that means in, a, in our current world or future world is itself going to be significant. It's going to be to a degree where it's going to change the course of action of how people conduct themselves. That is an affront to the power of God itself. Daniel mentions this fact. It's not a coincidence that he mentions it here early in this psalm, this hymn to God. At this man will rise himself to do what God himself has the power to do, not what the Antichrist has the power to do. Then he says he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding at the end of 21. That is, those who seek him will be given wisdom and understanding. And Daniel is the product of that because now he's been given understanding of what needs to be said in order not only to save the life of himself and his three friends and the others, that is the other quote-unquote wise men, but also we're going to learn that this dream has to do with the future kingdoms of the world, which includes us. Believe it or not, this dream has application for us. He also has the power to raise up kings and to remove them. That was the beginning of verse 21. Now verse 22, he reveals deep and secret things. And, he's, and he knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells in him. As we know, John tells us that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, but he's also the revealer of everything. Nothing is hid under God, so he uncovers all things. So we're getting a great, how can I put this? A great theology proper 101. When I say the word theology proper, what I'm referring to specifically is the study of God himself. If I were studying, if I were teaching a theology class, there are lots of things in theology you can study. I'll give you some words you may know. Things like ecclesiology. Anyone know what that word means? Ecclesiology, ecclesia, the Greek word. What's that? Church. The study of the church. Right, right. We have the term pneumatology, <laughs> breath which means spirit, so the study of the Holy Spirit. Hermotheology, hermotias, hermotia, the study of sin, so the study of sin. Soteriology, soteros, which is the study of salvation. Christology, the study of Christ. Eschatology, eschatos, the study of end, end times, like Revelation. <laughs> That's the Greek word eschatos, last things. But when I say the term theology proper, I'm referring to the God Father, God the Father. I'm referring to that. Not pneumatology, not Christology, but primarily God the Father. What we're getting here is a primer on his power right here. And this, by the way, is being read by who? Is it read entirely by the Hebrews? No, they're in captivity right now, being forced to not study Hebrew, kind of trying to learn Aramaic, but this is being written to who? The Gentile pagans who are living there. The pagans are reading this. So the God of heaven, the God above heaven, is now this God, and he defines who that God is here. So if you don't know who that God is, oh, pagan Babylonian, here's who, who he is. And he defines and begins to lay out who God is. And he does it with the confidence knowing that God has already given him the answer to what the king wants. Okay, now, after all that's being said, he ends his hymn, he ends his psalm, his beautiful music, words-wise, lyrics, I should say, with thanksgiving, as we all should when we pray. Here's what he says. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. You have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Very, very, very simple. God's sovereignty, God's knowledge all being thanked because of God's mercies given to them. Did Daniel know that God would exactly give him all the answers when he spoke to the king? There's nothing in the language of the text that tells you he did know. He just knew, I have one shot 
Lord, we need you. I know that you can answer it. No one else can. And God's mercies, that God's mercies, what? To the pagan wise men who didn't believe in God? No, God's mercies to Daniel. God's mercies to Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, those four. Well, I thought they're perfect people. No, they're not. They're sinners like you and I, saved by the grace of God. They're not perfect people. Daniel was not perfect. But he lived righteously in the sense that he sought to please God. But he himself knows because he's in this moral coil that he is, by nature, by birth, a sinner. He didn't give in to sin because the text of the Bible makes it clear he kind of wasn't a guy who did that. But nonetheless, he did need a redeemer. He does need a savior like we all do. So he asked for the mercies of God and he thanks God for the mercies in giving him the vision. Now that's done. Now he lays the thanks, the prayer's gone, and so here's what happens. Now I'm going to quickly run just a few more verses, but I'm not going to comment too much because I'll leave you on the cliff. <laughs> my, my goal is to leave you on the cliff, but i got to get there. There's so many verses in this chapter, so I want to just kind of move forward here because it's all self-explanatory now. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, to whom the king appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Keep in mind, the wise men were not killed at this point yet. Do you see that? He's telling them not to kill them. Then Ariel quickly brought Daniel before the king and said, Thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah, who will make known the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? That, of course, was the Babylonian name for Daniel, to keep their mind. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And so I'm going to stop right there. So what has happened is he's given the, he's given the macro. I'm giving it to you right now. The dream that Nebuchadnezzar has is a dream for the future of the world. This is not for a dream five years from now. But it's going to be a very unique dream because it's going to give you an understanding of the empires of the world. And it's going to show you by element what they represent and what their, what their powers. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to unravel it all for you and it's going to hopefully blow your mind. So it's going to be very cool. So that is what I'm going to leave you off right now. And then Dan's going to spend the rest of chapter two explaining what this thing, this image is that is on and has so bothered Nebuchadnezzar. No, don't stop. Oh, I have to. <laughs> I have to. Well, there's a lot I had to go through. Maybe if I felt like I wanted to jump through, but I'll, I'll do it next week. So, thread. Okay, well, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Um, Father, we're coming to another cliffhanger today, but Lord, we know that this has a great application for us because we're going to see that our world is in this image now, right now as we speak. And Father, I hope that as we talk about this, that we'll begin to connect a lot of things that are happening now with what Daniel's vision seen. So Father, we thank you for just getting us through this particular chapter, and I pray that you would bless it uh, as we finish it off next week and then talk about the trial of faith that comes in chapter 3. Father, Lord, I pray that you would help us to know Daniel's heart. We recognize that he is a great man who loved you. And Lord, I pray that we would understand by the prayer that he gave, this song of, of praise to you, that it would be a help to us understanding how we are to pray to you. Jesus, your son, gave us the model prayer. And in that prayer, he gave us the first thing that we're to do, and that is to give you glory. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's how the prayer was given. And Daniel begins by giving you praise, by giving you praise, by knowing that you are omniscient, that you are omnipotent, 
that you're omnipresent and that all things are under you and that you are sovereign above all things. And so, Father, thank you for the example of Daniel, and I pray that you bless this study as we are just beginning it. And so, Father, I thank you, and I pray that it would just be a wonderful blessing to us. I also pray for all those that are here and all those that are watching that you would attend and bless and direct our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.